Quakes lose another. Tons to discuss, the status of the team. We take your Twitter questions. It could not be any more serious and intense as this. It is episode five of Black and Azul, and it starts now. Welcome back to Black and Azul. Joel Soria, Charles Wolin with you here in studio. The Quakes lose their third game in a row to open up their season and a second half, which really, really was not the second half they had been hoping for after scoring first in New York. Putting together somewhat of a good first half seems to be a similar theme so far this year. First and foremost, welcome back, Charles. It's good to have you back on here. And yeah, absolutely atrocious game by the San Jose Earthquakes. A first 45 minutes that showed some good glimpses uh, from Matias Almeida's side. But overall, as you've said, you know, this team is just really, really two or three feet behind everyone else in the competition. And it's going to take time and the defending couldn't be any worse. Yeah, four goals conceded in the second half, all from crosses, all kind of low on the ground, all kind of within the six or around that area. And, you know, there's a lot to be said kind of about the concentration of the team. How does Matias Almeida maybe manage having a 1-0 lead as well? These are two 1-0 leads that have kind of gone awry in the first game. At home, of course, they had the 1-0 lead against Montreal. They had a 1-0 lead here. And so where do we begin to kind of assess where the concentration comes into play, the fitness comes into play, and the personnel come into play, right? Where his changes are. Yeah, correct. There's there's really just a lot to unpack, and I know we've mentioned that before, but there really is. Uh, let's let's look at this on a wider scale. First and foremost, the New York Red Bulls, obviously one of the best teams in in the entire league, did not play with two of their key players. One in Kaku, who obviously is is the star of the team for some personal reasons, conflicts with Coach Armas. He was excluded from the 18. Also, Kamara Lawrence, out with injury, did not play at all. Two key pieces for the New York Red Bulls weren't there. We said it all along. These next couple of games are going to be vital for the Earthquakes, not only because they have tough competitors lined up ahead of them and also have an uphill battle to take on. Overall, though, this team is just not there mentally. This team is not there tactically, technically. It's lacking in so many facets. I'm not convinced that the players have the mentality to revert the situation that they're in. A lot of these players, aside from the four that were brought in by Jesse Fiorinelli this winter, lived through the mishaps of 2018. They were the ones who couldn't really pull themselves out of the rut that they were in. A lot was said last season about the team. The teams obviously took a defensive posture as soon as the uh, as soon as the the results weren't coming in. That is exactly what they're doing now. And let's look back. None of the players have been willing to come out of their comfort zone in terms of on the field or in front of the press. When they speak to the press, it's defensive, defensive, defensive. We have things to do now. The narrative that is being pushed is that that it's a process that they're trying to adapt the new style. Well, my thing is, is you can look at the Columbus crew. The Columbus crew over the winter time got rid of Greg Berhalter, who I believe is one of the, was one of the most influential coaches in the league for, in the past five years. They brought in Caleb Porter, who obviously knows the league. They kept pretty much the same player core. And look, the transition has been seamless. The, the Columbus crew, who, like the San Jose Earthquakes, don't have any true DP, have been able to put pull out seven points out of their first three matches. One of the best teams in the East and arguably one of the best teams in MLS. I don't know. I don't know what, what other excuse they're, they're going to try and, and pitch, but it's, it's not working. At the end of the day, it is not working. The players aren't showing any differences on the field mentally as they did last year. What's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, we'll get into the specifics of, you know, what we believe 
it is the best moving forward. Let's kind of analyze the the post game quotes uh, of Matias Almeida, uh, you know, from from this game and, and chat about that really quickly. You know, what w- what we do know. He says, uh, "I have confidence in our team. It's not easy to change the style of play after the team is accustomed to a different one. We want to fight for the ball, mark zones, and be the protagonists in each game. In the first half, we were able to do that." If we are able to maintain that for longer, the team will be able to get out of the hole that we are in. Kind of taken from that quote, it seems a bit 50-50. He seems happy with the first half, but not the second half. He saw that his team was a protagonist in the in the first half, basically being the, the aggressor, the, the team that has the bulk of the possession, that has the bulk of the chances. You saw a, a chance that Vaco unfortunately, wasn't able to turn home. Three. Many of them. Clear ones. <laughs> and, and here he is saying that he still has confidence in the group. You know, where do you take it with these with this quote? No team that the Earthquakes have played against have been unafraid of giving the Earthquakes possession. We've said this from the go. The Earthquakes have had possession of the game for the most part, have had the ability to dictate the pace of the game, to, to be able to really craft what they want to implement. At the end of the day, nothing has come from it. I mean, aside from two goals, one which came against the New York Red Bulls and was a good play by Magnus Eriksson and by Cristian Espinosa, who has been one of the few bright spots for the San Jose Earthquakes. Outside from that, nothing has happened. I mean, the same scenarios from last season keep reoccurring where you have this fragile back line. There is no fighting spirit from the players, regardless of what they say after the match. You know, this team is starting to look a lot like 2018, right? And, and I, you know, I, I don't know what the next step is going to be. Obviously, they have Monterrey up in, in on Saturday. This is going to be a good chance for Matias Almeida to try and give other players who've been out of favor, like Florian Youngworth and s- certainly some of the younger players as well, time on the field, see what they can produce against the best team I believe, the best team north of, of, of Brazil. So why do you think Florian Youngworth isn't playing? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, Florian Youngworth uh, w- was the player who probably was willing, or was the only player who was willing to come out of his comfort zone, right, in 2018. And what happened? He was punished, right? He slowly started fading from the 11 because of his beliefs, because he was being critical, he was being objective, and overall he was being realistic about the current state of the San Jose earthquakes. I don't know, I, I we, we would be touching, you know, a lot of speculation, you know, we would be diving into a, a, a speculation area here to say that that's been the case this season as well. But Florian Youngworth, I'm sure, is not in Almeida's plans at the moment. I don't know how long that's going to go on for, you know, but he is a player obviously that was against the way that the team was functioning last season. He is the type of player that the Earthquakes need at this very moment because not only is he productive on the field, but he also has that fighting spirit that a lot of the players in San Jose are unwilling to show. Yeah, and I think that a lot of fans are clamoring for his name. You, you see that a lot online. You you kind of feel that from the group, and you're right. He has that uh, different next level that he truly, truly cares. He cares about the team. Yeah. He, care, he, he feels identified with the crest. He feels identified with the colors, which sadly, some of the players just don't. And unfortunately, we, we've kind of left him out of a, a, a few of our shows in the beginning here. But you know, it's a, it's a player that probably could be used now, and also a player that's a that can play at any different position: right back, center back, defensive center mid, probably attacking center mid. Can even play him as a winger. Probably First wouldn't want him as a go- goalkeeper or or he's a center much, forward. He's but done can everything. Play, he's play done everything, it. right? Yeah. You know. Um, okay, so moving forward to Chris Wondolowski's quote after the match, he was saying on what the team needs to work on. We're missing that killer instinct. I think if you're able to get a second one, a third one, it changes the game. It changes their game plan. It changes our game plan. It changes the game. If you're at 1-0, they're in it. They're full of energy, and I'm sure they got a good talking to, and they came out firing and punished us rightly so. So there's a lot in that one compared to the the one just before it. He 
has a, a nice little bit of prose there if you're kind of a poetry person, a little bit of football romanticism as well, but he knows you kind of have to kill the game off, and you see this frequently when you have a 1-0 lead. You just have to kill the game off, and this is a guy that scores goals, has scored goals his entire time, and the frustration is just pouring out from this guy that just needs some service in the box, and he just needs to score a couple and maybe get going. But with that being said, what do you think? He's not wrong. Chris Wondolowski has every right uh, to, to say what he had to say. It makes complete sense. But to me is, how long have the earthquakes been talking about, you know, finishing a game or convincing themselves that they have the ability to win games? Charles, it's been 500 plus days since the San Jose earthquakes have beat a team that is not Minnesota United or FC Dallas. There is something deeper going on here, right? The team hasn't won in over 200 days. That says a lot. It, it's 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 not just you know convincing yourselves or or it's not just having that killer instinct. There's a lot of things going on here behind the scenes that isn't working in the team's overall favor. First, it's the mentality of the players. If Matias Almeida is convinced that he has the players to make the system work, then he's going to have to start convincing them mentally. He's, he's going to have to start pressing on them and restricting them from certain things that they're, they haven't been restricted from doing in the past. The second one is the roster. If the San Jose Earthquakes feel that they have a future with Matias Almeida, they're going to have to accommodate him and give him a completely different roster than the one that the San Jose Earthquakes have been functioning on for the last two years. Charles, there are a lot of things and I'm sure you have some as well. Yeah, I mean, you either back the manager and you get him his players, uh, or he continues to have poor results and you keep the players and you get rid of the manager. If these results continue, you know, say we're sitting here maybe seven, eight matches in. I mean, I would hate for the guy to go already, but, you know, or... Number three, which I think not a lot of folks are really talking about, but it is the manager and the players adapting to one another a little bit more. So the manager can put his style forward and the players can play into that system. But it's quite clear, even though it's a good system and I believe in playing the way that Matias Almeida wants to play, and I love watching a team that's well-drilled and can play that way, but the players are having a difficult time playing that way. They're not fit enough, and they are having a tough, tough time kind of figuring things that out, and the bench is thin. And then so, as the manager who needs to get results, and this is a results business, okay, does he change the system? How does he tweak it? And that kind of thing. Personally, I'd like to see three number three, option three, thrown around a little bit here, and maybe a little bit of option one. So I'd like to see him stay, and I'd like to see him get a couple extra players, but also I'd like to see the system change a little bit and maybe do a couple little things here and there. I, I don't know if Matias Almeida is going to change his system. He's been keen on this system ever since he started managing with River Plate. Uh, a couple years ago, he, he did it at River for a year, he did it at Banfield, and he obviously won titles with Chivas. It proved to be effective. Now, I'm gonna echo off a little bit on what you had to say regarding the players and, and the, the style of play that Matias is trying to implement. If we started, if we actually look at it, the, the players that they brought in have not really been struggling under his system. Jutson has flourished as that box-to-box -box holding midfielder for Matias Almeida. He's been all over the floor. He's He's been a destroyer. He's been he's been everything that the Earthquakes could have asked for. The Angolo Cante. Yeah, the Angolo yeah. Cante <laughs> uh, of, of MLS. Vega has done his work. He's had some terrific saves. And he actually can play with his feet. He can he can yeah. orchestrate you know the the uh, the attack from the back, and he can really dictate the the pace of the game in terms of you know filtering it from the back and and, and whatnot. Also, Espinosa has proven to be a gem in, in the attack. You know, a player that the earthquakes, a type of player the earthquakes haven't had since you know Vaco first arrived in that first season and and really flourished under under Dom Kinnear. I now agree with the narrative. This is going to take time. 
time to revamp the roster. I'm going to go back to that. This team needs to put together something that is going to suit Matias Almeida's strengths. Currently, I'm not convinced that he has it. And what do you think he needs to add to the roster? Clearly, I think a center mid, a center back, and uh, maybe another outside back potentially um, as cover. We were just recently talking about Wondolowski. If you look at his numbers, he really hasn't had much activity whatsoever. No shots recorded on target last the last two games. He's going to need a Alan Pulido-esque type of number nine who's going to hold the ball, who's going to allow those fullbacks or those wingers to pinch in and to really generate more chances uh, all over the field, not just on the right side, which Matias Almeida has emphasized time and time again. You're going to have to shift over Vaco centrally you know, to allow him to play the game that he really flourishes uh, doing and, and bring in a left winger as well. I mean, there are a lot of pieces that Matias Almeida and co could really integrate to make this team better. We're going to have to wait and see if the Earthquakes ownership is going to want to open up the pockets. That has, has been the biggest struggle for this franchise historically, is the willingness to put the money up front. But then again, they did invest in this squad a couple of years ago as well, and they've given Matias Almeida some of his players already. So if, if I'm the ownership and I'm the management, and I'm saying, hey, you know, you, you have quite a few players, why don't you maybe change your system, maybe change your ways a little bit, and then it maybe gets into a gray area where it could get uh, a little dicey, if you know what I mean. So if the ownership does say no, then what does the manager do, right? That's, that's another point. Right, and that could be what happens. So, the earthquakes, they get a chance to rest a little bit. Uh, it's an international break. Uh, Mexico will play Paraguay at Levi's Stadium next Tuesday. And the earthquakes this Saturday will host Monterrey with actually quite a few stars from the Monterrey side uh, in the Mexican national team uh, coming up next week. Uh, good chance for the Quakes to just kind of chill out, get their legs, also for Monterrey. Play their youngsters. Play their youngsters, exactly. Play the youth, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think we mentioned this just earlier in the show. This this is a, a good a good platform, a good scenario for the Earthquakes to, to play their youngsters, you know. Uh, coming into this season, we thought maybe players like Calvillo, players like Fuentes, were going to maybe Paul Maurice. Some of these players were going to get in the mix. Uh, Matias Almeida has remained steady on on the 14 players that he's been playing week in and week out. So this will definitely be a, a, a good time to get a different look of what the San Jose Earthquakes can potentially be. Not that it's going to be any better. But maybe they play the style a bit more convincingly, right? And against a Monterrey side that is going to have a lot of reserve players, a lot of academy players as well, but still a good test because Monterrey, without a doubt, is you know Mexico's most lucrative team. It's, it's Mexico's probably best team at the moment. In, in Liga MX, they, you know, they're in contention to, to win it all. You know, Liga, to win the league, and potentially win the CONCACAF Champions League. I, I don't think, there, there aren't many people who don't consider them as favorites. Yeah, I mean, they beat Atlanta as well in a pretty hard-edged, uh, hard-fought battle between the two sides, 3-0 uh, at home, and then uh, losing 1-0 away, but uh, advancing and, and kind of proving to be quite the team to beat in, in, in the CONCACAF Champions League. And as you said, uh, very, very um, uh, good position in, in the in the league currently at this time. And, and also, it's a chance for some of these players to maybe see if they can get a chance in the first team as well for the Earthquakes. Because if they perform well, I don't think any position is odds on, nails on, you know, right glued to the flooring in the first choice 11. I think that, you know, any player is really untouchable. If you have a great performance, why not? Why not throw them in there to, you know, a, a league match and potentially get into the 11? Yeah, I, I agree. We'll, we'll see what happens. Twitter question time now. Our first question from Misplaced74 New York, Matt Wyke. He writes, we saw a mostly positive looking 45. How do we turn a good 45 minutes into a good 60 or maybe 70 minutes? 
That's the question of the past two years. <laughs> we assessed this just a couple of minutes ago. It's There's a plethora of things that can be done in order to convert those good 45 minutes, which honestly I don't think were that convincing. They did generate chances in the final third, but how susceptible were the earthquakes when defending? They were they were they were pretty open, you know. New York Red Bulls were able to get the ball and run it down with ease. They also had their fair chances. The stat sheet doesn't lie. 27 shots, eight on target. The first half, obviously, like we said, does have some positives. Can't take that away from them. But the mental game, the mental fortitude of the players needs to improve. Obviously, the the finishing needs needs to improve as well. They need to hold the ball a lot better when trying to transition into attack. I mean, there's a there's a million things this team can do in order to you know play a complete seventy minutes. Is that if that's what they're that's what they're shooting for? You know, this is a complete opposite of the Goonie era. You know, the, the magic is is gone. It slipped away. It's been stripped, confiscated for a long time. Will that change? We're going to have to wait and see. But, you know, the schedule doesn't doesn't look like it's it's going to allow for for change to come immediately. I think that the Quakes uh, need to be able to do what Wando said in his quotes, be able to kill a game off. If you get the chances, finish them. It's got to be the second. It's got to be the third goal. And if you're Matias Almeida, They're if you're in the 60th, so. 60th or 75th minute, though, you also have to pull your pull your players back and not press so hard and have one outlet on the wing or have your number nine be able to hold the ball up for you. I think it's and, fair to and say be able that to sit in a little bit. I think it's fair to say that Matias substitutions have been questionable. the The TT experiment at, at fullback needs to end. There's two goals towards the later stages of the game that, to me, were due to the fact that Tommy Thompson is not a defender. I mean, it's pretty clear. He's never been a defender his entire career. And you're trying to make him a fullback because you lack true fullbacks. And we go back to the roster makeup of this team. This team is not complete. You're trying to improvise way too many times, like... Mikel Starry had to do, like Ralston had to do, where you're playing players completely out of position. We saw Shea Salinas also suffer from that, trying to convert a winger into a left back. This shouldn't be happening. You know, if the team really wants to make, you know, a, a, a progress, if they really want to, to take two step forwards and not go one step back, you have to have the right roster for that, and right now they don't. This is a sign of a guy that doesn't feel like he has the right roster, and there's gonna have to be moves made. I mean, we just talked about it earlier in the show, what's the choice? He's gonna have to bring in some players, he's gonna have to continue to build um, on what he's got because he doesn't trust everyone yet, um, clearly uh, in this in this system, in, in, in his side. And back to the you know bit about the tactics. If you are nursing a one nil lead and it is the sixty fifth minute or the seventy fifth minute, you're right, Joel. He needs to be able to manage his substitutions the right way. If he needs a goal, do you throw on a second striker? Do you uh, you know take out a, a fullback and play three in the back? And Danny Husen and then, hasn't started a game. Florian Youngworth hasn't seen a single minute. So these are all questions that need to be answered. If you need a goal, you've got to throw on an, an, maybe another striker and have a front two with two wingers and, and, and really go for it. But if you're also nursing that one nil lead, you got to sit back a little bit and relax and have your number nine be that outlet or be, have one of your wingers. Christian Espinosa would be a fantastic addition to playing the ball down the sideline to him, having him hold the ball up down the sideline, or you know maybe beating his marker, beating his man, getting to the end line, maybe winning a corner if you're up 1-0 in the 70th minute. So it's about getting the right players and also managing the 90 minutes altogether to be able to piece this together. But do, but do the San Jose Earthquakes have a strong back line in order to secure a clean sheet? Well, so that's the thing. I think you pull the wingers back tactically. You have to pull them back a little bit and you have to sit in a little bit more defensively. And I think that's what- I'm not what convinced that they can hold a, a clean sheet. I'm not convinced that they can 
counter, you know, these potent attacks with the four players that they're offering back there. And I, I just, I don't see it happening. And with extra protection in a 65th or 75th minute with your wingers tracking back and helping out and maybe playing a true 4-5-1 and, you know, packing it in with two extra double pivot holding midfield players, you know, that could be the, the answer to that. Because this team does need a result and they need a result quickly. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's not going to look so great on their resume and things are going to get even kind of crazier for the fans and everyone's just going to be hungrier, thirstier for a result. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> convinced that the fans are, are ready to, you know, to, to really boycott this team at the moment. It, you know, like we go, we're just really repeating ourselves here. It's It's been 500 days, Charles, 500 days plus since the earthquakes have been a team who is not Dallas or Minnesota. I know what what else is there to say? This team is in a dire situation. This is it's bad. It's bad. There's no other way to put it. it it's it's really bad. Matt Wyke, you have poked the bear and you have opened up another can of worms for us on this show with your Twitter question. So thank you for allowing us to analyze. Our last question is from Anthony Perry, and he writes thoughts on the new food trucks and the drum on game day. Interview with the Quakes San Francisco meetup. What to expect with U23 call ups for Jackson and JT Marcinkowski? Okay, so that's like a four part question. I'll take the first bit the food trucks and the drum on game day. I don't know much about the food trucks, neither does Joel, but I will guarantee you the food trucks at Avaya Stadium are some of the best in the land. They don't just pick these food trucks out of anywhere. I will defend every food truck anytime, anywhere at that stadium. Uh, little thought, little note. I used to work for the team back in the day and they used to have a wonderful Korean food truck. And that food truck literally was the best food truck ever. It had the best kimchi, the most wonderful uh, spicy sauce. So there's that. I wonder but if food trucks <laughs> changed the results of the game. Potentially. Um, the big drum, I like it. Why not? Why not big the, uh, excuse me, beat the big old drum around? I think it's a, a nice piece, a nice thing to get atmosphere going. I think Crazy George is really involved. Uh, I like to see that. If anything, it is a positive thing. Um, I'm not sure how all supporters feel about the drum, and, you know, that's also up to them, how they how they want to feel about the drum. Um, the other part of this question is uh, the interview on the San Francisco Quakes meetup. Yes, we will get some sort of something like that going for the future. I can't promise a specific episode, but we'll work on that. You're the San Francisco guy. If anyone, <laughs> it's going to be you pulling the strings there. And then the last question I'm going to throw it to you is, what do you expect with U23 call-ups for Jackson Ewell and JT Marcinkowski? That's a good opportunity for both players to get extra training, to, to get a, a, a different approach to the game. And obviously for JT, it's crucial because he has been lauded as you know, the Earthquake's biggest prospect and one of the U.S.'s best goalkeepers uh, of that age group. So it's good for him. It's also good for Jackson Ewell, who's been seeing some minutes with Matias Almeida. You know, any national minutes that they, these players can get is, is going to obviously serve them, uh, serve them well for, you know, the future. And maybe down the road, these players will be with the U.S. national team. Who knows? But, you know, you can't really say anything negatively about that. They're yeah. in consideration for the U23. Good for them. You know, it's going to help them out. Yeah, Marcinkowski, a, a homegrown player, spent a lot of time at Reno, you know, has really kind of worked his way up in the earthquake system. He, he's the kind of player that also wears the, the patch on his sleeve, the patch over his heart, and, you know... Depending on how the season goes, <laughs> he could be between the stakes this season, you know? He, to me, is the only other goalkeeper who can really compete against Daniel Vega for that starting goalkeeper spot, so, yeah. And he does wear he does wear the crest with pride. He's he's someone who was nurtured and raised by the black and blue. He's gonna want to you know play for the team with pride uh, eventually. And for Jackson Yule, this is a good chance for him to get some good quality minutes with other players around his age group, but also a player that's that's been in and out of the side for such a long time with this team. And so it's a really uh, another solid productive. Uh, chance for this guy. You I know? agree. 
Well, that is our show for today. We appreciate you tuning in to Black and Azul. By tuning into this broadcast, you help grow the game in this country, and we appreciate you. For Joel Soria, I am Charles Wolin. Make sure that you like, you subscribe, you maybe tell a friend about Black and Azul, and we'll see you next week.